Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's conversation, Race, Sports, and Democracy, the History of Black College Football. My name is Corey Walker, and I'm the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities and Director of the Program in African, of African American Studies here at Wake Forest University. I'm delighted to have you join us tonight for what promises to be an exciting and intellectually stimulating conversation with a dear friend and exemplary scholar, Professor Derek White, on his latest book, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Jake Gaither, Florida A&M, and the History of Black College Football, published by the University of North Carolina Press. Before we begin tonight, I wanna to thank our partners who collaborated with us on tonight's program. I wanna thank the students and faculty in the program of African-American studies at Wake Forest for their interest and support in this important program. And I also wanna thank our colleagues and Wake Forest University Athletics and the Slavery, Race and Memory Project at Wake Forest for making tonight possible. A reviewer in the Journal of Sport History writes, the history of black sporting achievement in America is often told through the lens of a handful of legendary racial pioneers at the expense of the accomplishments of uniquely black cultural institutions. In Blood, Sweat and Tears, Derek White tells the story tells the sporting history of historically black colleges and universities in general and HBCU football in particular, utilizing the context of Florida A&M University during the post-World War II period and the school's legendary coach, Alonzo Jake Gaither, who led the team for 25 years in the post-war period through the early years of the civil rights movement until the end of the 60s. I'm delighted to have Derek join us this evening to talk to us about a book that we should all add to our bookshelves, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Derek, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. And I wish we were at a point in our country in which I could come down to Winston-Salem to visit you guys. I, uh, you know, I enjoy the area. Uh, and it's been a long time since I've been at Wake Forest, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here via Zoom, but also sad that we cannot do this face-to-face -face and in person uh, in front of uh, a wonderful audience. So let's continue to, to make the best of our Zoom life here at the, at the university. That's, that's what we'll have to do. I remember you came in our class uh, in the spring. You visited with us uh, by via Zoom, and we thought we'd be able to have you here in person, uh, but this is the next best thing. And of course, since this week, uh, Wake Forest University, uh, our Demon Deacons host Norfolk State University uh, on the gridiron on Saturday uh, at 12 noon, it's apropos that we have tonight's conversation about this wonderful uh, book. Derek, tell us, how did you come to write this book about Jake Gaither? Florida A&M and the history of black college football. I had the wonderful opportunity of being an assistant professor uh, at Florida Atlantic University um, and started a the sports history course down there. And I'd ask students to do what I called an institutional biography of the various kinds of institutions in the state of Florida. And so for many, uh, that included doing the history of race, the history of gender and sports. Uh, and one of the things I loved about Florida was that you had old universities like the University of Florida, you had private schools like Miami, but you also had historically black colleges. Uh, and you had relatively new uh, universities such as FAU and FIU and South Florida and Central Florida. So it gave students opportunities to tell different kinds of histories uh, about sport. Students come back as they did, as they do, and they couldn't find anything on HBCUs. And I'm like, I know there's a book, I know there's something about Jay Gaither because uh, my brother had gone to Florida A&M and I knew that he was at one point uh, the, the winningest coach in uh, college football history uh, as the way they defined it down in Tallahassee. 
Uh, I mean, as I investigated student claims, it was I was really surprised that there had not been the kind of attention to black college sports more generally, but also Jay Gaither's legacy. Um, black college uh, football in particular has basically been boiled down to the legacy of Eddie Robinson and really as great as Eddie Robinson's legacy was when they were contemporaries one of the things that got overshadowed is that Gaither was uh, really his not only his peer but he was the person that uh, Robinson was chasing uh, in kind of greatness uh, in HBCU football ranks and so I set out to try to tell that story uh, over the course of a number of years. So in going and setting out to tell the story of Jake Gaither and really with uh, the broader story of black college football and, of course, the development and evolution of HBCUs, you find yourself in the late 19th century, four years after the conclusion of the Civil War, first college football game being played between Princeton and Rutgers, the first game, college football game in the South. Uh, will be played by Wake Forest University against the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1888. Wake Forest will win 6-4 uh, in that contest. And you find something happening in 1892. Mm -hmm. Before we get up to 1892, talk to us a bit about those early years of college football in the late 19th century and what they meant to American life and college life in general. What happens really between 1869 and, and, and 1892 at mostly predominantly white institutions in the Northeast, but eventually in the South, as you noted, beginning in the 1880s, is that college football becomes a mechanism for which young men who were not quite old enough uh, to participate in the Civil War to assert their kind of masculinity uh, on what they then called the gridiron, right? Uh, and so one of the things that uh, football has always prided itself on was the kind of physicality of the game. It was a very dangerous game. In fact, the game was nearly uh, snuffed out because of tragic deaths uh, in the late 19th century. Um, uh, many of a university of reformers, such as Charles Elliott at Harvard, most notably, uh, tried to end the game. Schools like Johns Hopkins had football and then ended it and then started it back. And so that's part of the legacy of, of that. And at the same time, when we think about the issue of race, this is also the period in which African-American rights are rapidly declining after the Civil War. And so we see uh, the end of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow happening at the very same time that football is growing more popular. And so as a mechanism for college educated men, it becomes a metaphor for not only the ways in which they want to live out their kind of masculinity, but also a way that they live out a kind of racialized worldview uh, on inside this kind of orderly, uh, orderly field that, that they call the gridiron. So we have this masculine uh, contest going on uh, on college campuses, your Harvard's, your Princeton's, your Rutgers, uh, Amherst. And then on a snowy December day, December 27th, 1892, something catalytic happens in North Carolina, Salisbury, North Carolina. There's a contest between two institutions. Talk to us about the emergence of black college football on that day and the early years of black college football. One of the things that we see in that first game between Biddle, now Johnson C. Smith and, and Livingstone College is that these young men are not any different than their white counterparts in the Northeast, that they too are trying to figure out how they are going to live out uh, their manhood uh, in this ever-changing kind of late 19th century America. But they have the additional pressures of what trying to figure out what it means to be Black in a world, uh, in a really in an anti-Black world. And I think that football becomes for them a way of which they can assert some measure of equality on this opportunity, at least amongst themselves. And so the game itself becomes, much like Black colleges, a space upon which uh, Black educated men 
can can create kind of a middle class uh, racial uplift, uh, embody the ideas and ideals of what becomes black manhood, the, you know, a type of manhood that is limited in some ways by the racial order of 19th century America. And so on that day, I, I want to make a, just a quick kind of historical question. Like people talk so much about that day, like 1892. And I always stop to ask the question, because, you know, as a historian, how did they, you know, football is not intuitive. I think that's the one thing that gets lost in this discussion. And so how did they learn how to play? Who was teaching them the game? Where do they get equipment? I mean, you know, it's not like baseball, which where, where baseball equipment by the 1890s was pretty ubiquitous across America. Where do they get the materials to, to, to fill out a, a football team? And so, I, you know, when you ask that question, you really begin to understand the ways in which football had began to seep into kind of educated, college educated men's lives through the media, through Spalding Sporting Goods, where they were ordering, you know, the footballs that they needed and the pads, and they were making their own equipment using old materials. That's the kind of um, forthrightness that Black colleges had to face, but it also speaks to the kind of ever expansion, ever expanding uh, footprint of football in uh, the United States. To echo that and amplify that, you really underscore the role of students in making football a reality at these institutions. Yeah, football, both at PWIs as well as at uh, historically Black colleges, was student-led initially, right? That we think of Walter Camp as the father of college football, uh, but but he it gets that role as a student, right? He's the one who's constantly trying to convince his classmates and others at the other institutions to reduce the number of men on the field from 15 to 11. And he's the one who's thinking about crafting the rules, most notably snapping the ball to the person that they call a quarterback and allowing one to keep possession, really differentiating the game between both soccer and rugby. Uh, and we see that same kind of impetus take place at uh, historically black colleges as well. Um, and, and the other piece that I want to emphasize is that these uh, young men as students, if they learn the game and as they learn the game, are also the very first missionaries of the game as well. And so when they graduate, they are the ones who are trying to learn. Uh, I note in the book how um, uh, Yale grads and Harvard grads are in high demand at universities trying to uh, start football programs. So if you had played football at Yale, we would love for you to come out to our institution. Walter Camp most famously, you know, basically coach, which is a loose term, but really taught the game to a whole host of universities, including Stanford uh, uh, on the West Coast. And so one of the things that I was most excited about is figuring out, well, who taught this to all these Black colleges, right? That not all these Black colleges had access to these rule books. And one of the things we realized, at least I realized, is that that first generation of college graduates, these uh, racial pioneers at these predominantly white institutions are often hired because there are no other jobs. Uh, they're hired at historically black colleges. And so uh, I talk a little bit about George Sampson, who's at Florida A&M, but also someone like Matthew Bullock, who went to Dartmouth and coached football at UMass and finishes his law degree ends up at Morehouse in part because John hopes like we would like you to come down here uh, and teach, but also coach our football team for, you know, and this is part of how the game of football spreads across among black colleges uh, during this time. You have a wonderful uh, chart on early in the book where you talk about uh, where you detail this. You have John Hope, who's a uh, his alma mater is Brown University, and of course he goes to Atlanta Baptist College, Morehouse College in 1899. Uh, C.C. Cook uh, moves from Cornell to uh, Howard University. Samuel Taylor out of Northwestern goes to Virginia State University. So there's this way in which you're gesturing towards it, and we're going to get to it. The gospel of football is being spread by these missionaries moving across uh, various domains from uh, predominantly white institutions to black institutions, as well as students becoming uh, converted to the gospel of football uh, and ign igniting that, that fire uh, in uh, uh, Salisbury, North Carolina, and continuing on. 
those early years of college football. We have a book here uh, that focuses on really, you know, one of the uh, tremendous forces in college football, Jake Gaither and those Rattlers at uh, Florida A&M. But in the early years of black college football, wasn't the Florida A&Ms, it was the Lincoln Universities, the Howard Universities, uh, Claflin, mm -hmm. uh, Morris Brown. Talk to us about those early years and the role of private church-related uh, Black institutions and their proudness on the, on the gridiron. One of the things that I did not anticipate uh, you know, in the research, and I think this is why we always, as scholars, really um, excited about the research process, is that you know, we think of Black college sports, we think of Grambling and Florida A&M and Tennessee State and Jackson State. On, on the PWI side, we think of Ohio State and Alabama, these big state universities. But one of the things that, uh, that I discovered is that because the church schools were much more, let's use the word, college affiliated, right, that they had post-grad focuses, that they were the ones who were able to really think about leisure and extracurricular activities as part of the broader curriculum that allow for them to develop very strong football teams. The other part of that is that they also had leadership, black leadership that recruited them, recruited faculty members from these PWIs, someone like Matt Bullock, John Hope is a is probably the quintessential example. He's writing letters to all these people. Did you graduated from Harvard? Would you like a job in Atlanta, right? And this is how he's getting him down there. Um, and so that role allows for them to be, uh, to really identify the kind of faculty members that they want on their institution as, as scholars, but also faculty members who are bringing a lot of attention to the extracurricular. And so one of the things that I discovered is that that black college football before World War II is dominated by private colleges, right? It's Howard, it's Lincoln, it's Tuskegee, it's um, uh, Wiley College, right? Is these church schools that are really uh, setting the pace for black colleges and, and, and really what's trailing these schools is really, you know, Florida A&M is, is really not a, a factor. Uh, Prairie View is not a factor. Tennessee State and Jackson State are not a factor. In part, and one of the reasons they're not a factor is that those schools have this massive educational process, right? They've got agriculture, they've got um, vocational students, they've got uh, teachers, normal schools, right? And additionally, they have some college students as well. And so when, I, when you look at the old um, US government, uh, documents about HBCUs, they actually list the number of students involved in each track. And you look at a school like FAM, they might have had like 30 college students, even though they had 300 students, they might have had only 30 college students in the college curriculum. And they might have had 100 in the normal school, which were mostly women who were going to go teach into the, um, go out into Black communities and teach. And then in the vocational track, they had a, a predominantly men, but those students were really taking classes, what we would think of as kind of like uh, late high school, because given the way segregated education worked, that these were also functioning as high schools as well. And so there's this really kind of class difference at about football that was like, look, Howard's like, I don't really want to play Virginia State because we don't know those guys aren't even taking college classes. And you see this debate amongst uh, administrators and the mentors for the football team trying to regulate who's being involved. Uh, and I think that's really what allows for black colleges, small church related black colleges to take the lead uh, before World War II. And of course they do come together to form the first league, the uh, Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association at CIAA schools like uh, Virginia Union, Howard, Lincoln, uh, these, uh, schools that go by the singular name, Union, Howard, Lincoln, you, they loom large uh, in that early history. But Jake Gaither, to, to sort of change our, our, our focus, Jake Gaither is pretty much part of what W.E.B. Du Bois would say, you know, comes out of that talented 10th milieu that finds themselves at the single name universities, the Howards, the Lincolns. Um, Talk to us a bit about Jake Gaither's early life, uh, particularly the influence of his parents 
uh, for, for to give us some background on Gaither. That's gonna be important as you continue to tell the story uh, in Blood, Sweat and Tears. Yeah, Gaither is born in, uh, you know, around the turn of the century in Northern Tennessee, Southern Kentucky. His family moves back and forth quite regularly on both sides of the border, in part because his father is a minister. And this allows them to have, uh, by, you know, early 20th century standards, a relatively um, decent life for Black folks, right? They're not sharecropping. They're not um, uh, they're not trapped in the kind of labor situation that many African Americans, especially in Kentucky and Tennessee, found themselves. And so they were poor, but they were not, um, but they were not necessarily trapped in, uh, you know, agricultural labor. And so this allows for Gaither, whose mom uh, was a teacher, to really emphasize education. And so uh, he comes through elementary, primary school in Kentucky, uh, in Middlesbrough. Uh, Kentucky, which is just on the, on the southern border of the state. Uh, and then he, they recognize that there's no real Black high school where they are living. And so they get the idea that they need to send him to high schools. They send him to Knoxville College, one of these church schools, Presbyterian schools, that to finish high school and begin his college. So he spends roughly six years um, eight years, excuse me, spends eight years at Knoxville College, four years of high school, right, which, and then he spends four years of college, uh, and this is really where he grows up and becomes an adult uh, away from his parents. His parents are back and forth, they come to visit him, but it's in that milieu, right, those single name schools, right, where they are getting this kind of education, and he goes, and as he develops as a young student, he fully anticipates that he's going to be a minister. He's going to follow in his father's footsteps. That's that's what they had anticipated for himself, for him, and that's what he thought of himself. He was a, a, um, a spectacular debater, an average football player by his own admission, um, and he thought that there's a, there's a great article uh, that he writes in the student newspaper where he defines himself as saying, I'm either going to be a lawyer or a minister. These are the only, because I can, you know, I can really talk. That was his thing. Um, and unfortunately, while he's playing in his senior year of, of college, uh, his father passes away uh, and he's really thrust. His mom uh, was reliant on that income. And so he doesn't have the ability to, to go to grad school. He had gotten an offer to go to seminary in Pittsburgh. He had to go to work. And so the Presbyterians, the church that runs Knoxville College, found him a job at this uh, black boarding school in North Carolina, in Henderson, North Carolina, at the Henderson Institute. And he goes out there uh, and part of his job is to teach social studies and coach all the athletic teams, basketball, track and field, uh, and football. Uh, and uh, he goes out there thinking that he, you know, he played eight years of college football, he knew what he was doing. Uh, and Henderson was terrible, uh, at least initially. And, yeah. and he was, you know, it's a humbling experience. We've all been young and, uh, uh, and thought we knew what was going on. And so I recognized that it, it, in that moment. Um, and so that's how that, that upbringing, uh, that church upbringing, as well as uh, the fa his parents' influence, and then the Presbyterian institution that runs uh, Knoxville College had put him on a path that he didn't necessarily see for himself um, and, and gave him an opportunity to earn money uh, to help support his mother and his siblings. And then eventually he gets married and he, he supports his wife as well and, and his family. So at Henderson Institute, you know, Gaither really gets involved in, in coaching football. He writes a letter. You detail the letter that he writes to Wallace Wade at Duke. He wants to go to uh, these coaching camps. Mm -hmm. uh, one, we wanted to go to one at Duke. He never gets a response from Wallace Wade by the, at the time. But because Henderson is uh, a boarding school, uh, and in North Carolina, there were folks who were very much aware that Henderson had this uh, football, um, almost saw Henderson as this football factory because they had an advantage. The students were there, they were in school, but they also lived there. So it was a bit unfair. Um, Talk to us, move us from Henderson to St. Paul's and then get us down to uh, Florida A&M. 
Well, I think it's a couple things happen here, right? That his initial years at Henderson, why his own admission were terrible. I don't think they scored but one touchdown in like two seasons. Uh, and he knew he had to learn more about the game. He wanted to go to the coaching clinic, which was the way that most coaches improve their coaching kind of acumen. Uh, and Wallace Wade did not allow him to do that. Um, uh, you know, I called it a pocket veto in a book, right? Because he just doesn't respond. But the thing that I think gets lost is Gaither, you know, begs. He's like, I'll be a janitor. I think this is the part. Like, he was like, I'll dress as a janitor so you won't have to de- – like, that way I can just learn what's going on without anyone actually knowing. Uh, and I thought that that was really a signal to how, um, how much desire he had to become a good coach. Eventually, that he goes to Ohio State uh, in the summer and begins starts taking master's classes and coaching clinics up there, and he really transforms Henderson Institute. They become a powerhouse in high school football uh, and black high school football in North Carolina. So much so that the public schools are like, "This isn't fair." There's a whole hubbub between football and basketball. Gaither's teams have won both the state championship in football and basketball, and they're like, "This is illegal." And so rather than deal with any more of that, he gets an opportunity to, be, to go to St. Paul in Virginia to be an assistant coach. Again, another humbling experience. They're not very good. The coach that they have quits in the middle of the season. And then Gaither, who goes from the second seat to the first seat, is now trying to figure out by the, um, by in the second season. And he's continuing at this time getting his master's degree, working on his master's degree at uh, the Ohio State University. Uh, and there he uh, becomes fast friends with William Bell, who was the first African-American, uh, all-American, all-conference player at Ohio State in football as well. And he was kind of a celebrity in those eras when we used to, you know, when you're a star player at a PWI, the black press made you a celebrity. And they begin to really collaborate very well about, you know, coaching philosophy, what they should be doing, their desires about how, where they want to work. Uh, Bell gets a job at Claflin. Uh, and in 1935, uh, uh, Bell gets the job at Florida A&M and the first person after a terrible first season, the first person he calls is uh, Jake Gaither to be his assistant coach. And now you've got literally two of the best kind of young minds who have been working as, as students, as colleagues, as friends for a number of years now on the same sideline in Tallahassee, the deep South, which for Gaither, he had never really spent a lot of time in the deep South. He, you know, Tennessee is still, Knoxville is still the South. Henderson is, you know, Warren County is a predominantly black county, even in North Carolina. But Tallahassee was a different order. Uh, and, and they had never been, him and his wife had never been that far South. So it was a big uh, leap of faith for both of them to move uh, to Tallahassee to take the assistant coaching job at Florida a and We've been talking about this a bit. Uh, elliptically, but you develop a, a notion, a concept to actually uh, help us to better understand Black college football. You call it uh, the congregation. And we talk about the newspapers, um, newspapers like the Norfolk Journal and Guide or the Pittsburgh Courier. The Journal and Guide came to Gaither's aid when St. Paul chose him as a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pittsburgh Courier carried stories of the day about Black college sports and the uh, broad personalities. You will also talk about the networks, the network between Bell and Gaither, the nexus of meeting at Ohio State and then moving that network uh, down to Florida A&M, as well as the network of administrators and faculty and colleagues at Black colleges who find themselves uh, continuing to support these institutions. Talk to us a bit about the development of the Florida A&M congregation. Yeah, the Florida A&M congregation, I think sporting congregation is, is to me vital. And it really, before Gaither even arrives, it's about J.B. Bragg. And if you know anything about Florida A&M football, they play in Bragg Stadium. And it is, it is the name after the, the man who, uh, after George Sampson introduces football, Bragg is basically the coach on and off. He becomes a dean. He becomes the interim president for like 30 years at, in Tallahassee from the 1910s to the 1940s. And so Bragg is the, the really the dean who's kind of always has his dean of men and he's a, he gets his 
Uh, he's teaching vocation, will writing at, <laughs> at uh, Florida A&M, but he's also a believer in higher education in that in the traditional sense. He goes to Tougaloo uh, after graduating from Tuskegee, goes to Tougaloo as a, a, back as an undergrad and plays football for a few more years and try to get a, what we think of as a classical kind of uh, higher education degree as opposed to kind of vocational degree. And so he comes back to Florida a and and he's really the kind of dean. And what he does is he realizes the ways in which sport can be uh, essential. And so they have, uh, Bragg is there. They have a president, J.R.E. Lee, who is, uh, comes on board and he is, you know, he becomes initially as a vice president. He's like, we need to figure out a way in which we can build into, to use modern parlance, our brand. And they come up with a, a classic, uh, the Orange Blossom Classic uh, in 1933. And they play it initially in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, in 1947, it moves to Miami and it's in Miami from 1947 to 1979. But the Orange Blossom Classic becomes the preeminent idea because they're looking at this growing bowl system, the Orange Bowl, the Rose Bowl, et cetera, Sugar Bowl, Cotton Bowl. And they're trying to mimic that in terms of Black colleges. And there was no Black college had done that yet. Um, black colleges had classics before the Orange Blossom Classic. They had Thanksgiving Day rivalries. Lincoln and Howard was probably the biggest um, they had 20,000 folks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like 20,000 people dressed yeah. to the nines, uh, you know, um, and and then what you also see is black people playing on the uh, color days of the state fairs. <laughs> and so the Texas State Fair most famously uh, held a, a the Texas State Fair classic, which often featured either Wiley or Prairie View at various points in time. Uh, and so what makes the Orange Blossom Classic different is that they're saying, look, this is going to be an end of the season game and we are not going to announce who we're going to play until about halfway through the season. And so they in the very first game, they somehow convinced Howard University, which was a powerhouse to literally play on Thanksgiving. I want you to think about this. They played on a Thanksgiving on a Thursday. They leave that Thursday night and they play again on Saturday. Uh, because it was the first Saturday in December because it was a five Thanksgiving day, a five Thursday month that year. And they get on a train, they travel to Tallahassee. The press is there, the courier is there, the Atlanta Daily World, all these, these newspapers are there. Uh, and FAMU pulls off this huge upset. And it's like now they're starting to write about this idea. Um, FAMU's not good, uh, and but they always have this aspiration to be good. And I think this is where the congregation comes in because their Bragg is in contact with all of these uh, media folks, sports writers, as well as other coaches. And he's trying to figure out who could be the best player, uh, the best coach for this, this, this program. Uh, and initially he thinks he finds it in his son who was an all American, but tragically dies from, uh, 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 from an appendectomy. I think is that his, his appendix bursts and he's not able to get to the hospital. And, this allows them in the aftermath of that to hire William Bell and the rest begins to really move in motion. But, you know, Bell and Gaither couldn't be successful in the 1930s, um, in the late 1930s, unless that congregation had already been, the seeds had already been planted. And that goes back to Bragg and J.R. Lee and the various presidents, Nathan B. Young and others who had really uh, supported uh, extracurricular activities at Florida A&M. So we see this this real communal effort uh, at black colleges. So part of what you bring out really is through that, uh, the sporting congregation idea is that it's not just the singular individual, although you have some exemplary figures, they're part of a culture, they're part of a broader cultural context, and they're, they're, it's part of a broader network, both media, educational, uh, communal, uh, as well as a broader sport network. I mean, Gaither is, is very important in, in actually networking Black colleges to Black high schools and mm -hmm. creating those uh, pipelines uh, for talent and talent development and also coaching development. We started in the 1930s, midst of a Great Depression. Uh, 1940, early 1940s, of course, we go into World War II. 
Um, there's some transformations in college football that also transforms uh, college football, uh, college coaching. Uh, Gaither makes a number of uh, interesting moves, philosophical moves uh, in this period. Talk to us a bit about Gaither's coaching philosophy and how it transforms along with the changing times. Well, the thing that Gaither develops, even when you go back and look at the, the reports about Henderson Institute, is that he develops this extremely aggressive coaching style. Uh, this is both in football and basketball. People forget he was a basketball coach at Florida A&M. And, and him and Bill Bell are really trying to develop the talent in Florida. And so one of the things about the Deep South, uh, even into the 1940s, that, that the high school months, uh, the high school year, was extremely short, that it was governed by the, you know, the agricultural schedule, right? And, and they found that the talent that they wanted to have to be successful was not as good as it was in the upper South. So it wasn't as good as it was in North Carolina. It wasn't as good as it was in Ohio where Bill Bell had, had played. Uh, and so one of the things that they realized leaning on these networks um, is that they recruited a whole bunch of players initially in the early 30s from Ohio and Pennsylvania and other places out of state to Florida A&M. Like you want to come down south and get a, uh, a college education. But they knew that was unsustainable because they knew that trying to transfer young black people into the deep south who may not be familiar with the kind of intricate ways in which Jim Crow um, uh, segregation worked in a place like Tallahassee was often a dangerous proposition. And so they understood that they needed to improve the coaching and the networks within the state. And so they began a coaching clinic. So just like the clinic that they couldn't go to, uh, Bill Bell and Gaither eventually developed their own clinic to develop not only players and coaches in the state of Florida, that hopefully that they would uh, matriculate to Florida A&M uh, University, uh, Florida A&M College at the time. The other piece is that in the 1940s, Gaither has what becomes two brain tumors, which is this, you know, literally uh, pa passes out after a basketball game. They don't know what's wrong with them uh, and has brain surgery in Vanderbilt. Uh, and no one could diagnose them in Florida but his classmate from Knoxville was working at Meharry Medical College and was like, come up here and we know someone over at Vanderbilt who can uh, do a test because we he's like, he suspected it was a brain tumor. And they did, they found these two tumors, did the surgery uh, and it didn't look like he was going to live, let alone coach again. He survives these two tumors uh, only to come back to Florida A&M uh, as a teacher and not have anything to do with athletics because it was too hard. Uh, but Bill Bell did not return after World War II. He goes to North Carolina a and to become a coach. Uh, the coach that they had in the interim, who as uh, Bell had gone to the military, he goes to Xavier University in New Orleans. And so they'll have a coach with weeks before the season and like, Gaither, would you like to be the coach? And he's like, he didn't even tell his wife. Now I know uh, I'm married, so I can't, I, I don't know how he got away with that, but she, she found out and she was uh, extremely angry because she knew that the kind of intensity that he approached coaching. Um, but he, he survives that first season uh, really still very diminished from the surgery. Uh, and he really starts to develop this idea that him and Bell had worked on. And he does a couple of things. One is that the World War II created unlimited substitution for the first time. Uh, college football was defined by two-way players. Uh, and he felt like, man, you know, if, you know, this unlimited substitution is great because now with the rosters can get bigger. This is allows for public black colleges to start to overtake their private college brethren. Uh, and the second part is that in 1956, I believe, or 1951, excuse me, um, the NCAA eliminates unlimited substitution. So they introduce it and then they eliminate it. And so Gaither starts to really think that, well, I've got all these additional players on my roster. I used to have 20 players, to be honest. I used to only have 20 players. Now I've got 40. Well, what can I do with these 40 players? And so he starts to come up with these platoon system and he comes up with the team's blood, sweat, and tears taking from the Winston Churchill speech from World War II. And uh, these platoons began to just overwhelm the opposition. The second thing is that he realizes now that he's got these coaches, he has to figure out what kind of, you know, players does he have in the state? 
and they have Florida uh, traditionally and now has produced a lot of fast players. And that's, and he realizes he's got speed and he creates an offense to split line T, which other people had used. Uh, but he uses it to kind of devastating pers- effect in part because, as he said, everybody in my backfield, the, you know, my three running backs and my quarterback all run the hundred in under 10 seconds, which the world record was like, you know, 10, uh, like nine, eight. And they're all world near world record speed. I imagine a lot of this is coach talk until you realize that, uh, you know, Bob Hayes was in the backfield in the early 60s and Willie Gallimore was in there in the early 60s as well. Uh, and so there's this, this whole kind of fleet beginning about 1957, 1958 of just an unbelievable number of amazing uh, backs that allow for Florida a and to have a, a, an identity, a football identity. So they have this game, but now they've got a football identity. And that was like, they were going to run over you and they're going to do it fast and they're going to overwhelm you with these kinds of numbers. And so that by, you see, by the early 1960s, they averaged like 51 points a game and they barely threw the football. Um, And uh, ESPN just did a thing. Bill Connolly at ESPN just listed the the greatest HBCU teams and uh, Florida A&M's 61 or 62 team finished number one on that list, which I think speaks well. I'm glad that I uh, wrote the book ahead of that list coming out. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, that is the golden age of black college sports. Uh, Bob Hayes and, of course, you know, what he's doing on the gridiron, but also in the 64 Tokyo games. Uh, it also occurs at a moment where there's a tremendous upheaval in broader society. The black, modern black freedom movement gets going. Talk to us about the interesting position of sport and Jay, uh, Jake Gaither uh, in that moment. I mean, the Tallahassee, the Tallahassee movement is a prominent uh, arm uh, on, in the Southern black freedom struggle. Um, there are a number of these athletes who have uh, platforms, if you will, uh, that can then u- utilize uh, their sporting prowess uh, to translate into civil rights gains. But Jake has a different perspective. Uh, yeah, no, Jake, Jake is not, he does not want his players to even participate in the civil rights movement, although many of them do. And he knows that they do because he knows everybody, you know, you if you've ever been to a black college, especially it, you know, black colleges, that everybody knows everything. Um, but he he was very much conservative in that sense, right? And I think the way that I describe it in the book is that he wanted to demonstrate the greatness of black colleges. I think sport allowed him to have a different take on integration. And he watched, for instance, what had happened to the Negro Leagues when Jackie Robinson breaks the color line within five to seven years, the Negro Leagues are no longer there. And so he believes that the institution that Florida A&M, his football program and similar institutions have something to contribute to this conversation that they should not just simply be used for their, you know, for their material, for their students or for their faculty to, to support Florida State or some other kind of predominantly white institution who now feels bad about segregation. And so this put him at, at odds in many ways or on the sidelines uh, or in the back rooms uh, trying to negotiate uh, you know, with the white power structure that is Tallahassee. The other piece is that he was a state employee and you know, all state employees run, ran the risk of losing their job. The Tallahassee bus boycotts is full of professors who got fired for simply uh, participating in the bus boycott. And he felt like he could be more effective in his position and working behind the scenes rather than on the front lines like C.K. Steele, who was a pastor of the local church and head of the local uh, chapter of the SCLC. The third piece is, I think, and I think this is more as equally important that gets overlooked, is that Gaither had to go into people's homes to convince those kids to come to his institution. And I, I think if he took that job seriously, the recruiting of a student athlete meant him or his assistant coaches had to go tell someone's mother or father 
from often from rural Florida that they were going to protect their kid away from home. And he took that job seriously. He had no children of his own. So he thought of these student athletes as his own children. And he taught, thought about it in a kind of paternalistic way, but thought about it in a real way. And I think that when one has to look a parent in the eye, then you and, and, and say that you're taking care of him. He believed in his word was 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 the one thing that he did not want to go back on. Uh, and so this is one of the things that you see in terms of him pr- trying to protect his players, uh, his his program, as well as the institution. And so that put him at cross purposes with the civil rights movement in many ways, um, while at the same time working behind the scenes to try to promote integration, get a game, uh, get equal pay for faculty members and his coaching staff. He's doing all these things at the same time, but not necessarily leading a bus boycott. And so people begin to worry, to begin to whisper that he was an Uncle Tom uh, during his time. And that really did trouble him, I think, near the end of his career. It's interesting because uh, in as much as he was also moving to try to get Florida a and uh, invited to the NAIA uh, playoffs, um, the team that would get invited would be Prairie View a and and they play in the Camilla Bowl, I believe mm-hmm. in 62. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and they come just a little short from that national championship in 62. But there's a, a there's a gap between the Olympics with Bob Hayes. Bob Hayes will eventually go off to the pros, of course, a, a gold medalist. And then 68, when you get, uh, 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 you know, you get uh, Todd uh, Carlos and Tommy uh, Smith. John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Um, and there's a there's a sea change, and there's also changes that are afloat uh, in black college football. Uh, talk to us about that transition, and this becomes uh, sort of the almost the, the, the ending part of Gaither's career. Uh, but there is the transition in black college football. His view of integration is institutional. Yeah, that the entire black college comes in, not individual, mm-hmm. but the individual runs out. Yeah, when, no, he's. You know, black colleges, people always ask, you know, what happens to, you know, those teams at Grambling at one point had more NFL players that only trailed like Notre Dame and Ohio State and NFL talent at, you know, in the mid 70s. And they're like, and then last year, no black college player got drafted in the NFL draft, right? And people are trying to figure out how do we explain that, that, that difference. Um, The central thing that I always say is that black colleges are being squeezed from two ends. On, on at the professional level, the NFL has desegregated and all these black players from Grambling and Florida a and and Jackson State and Tennessee State are doing amazing work in the AFL initially and then eventually when the two leagues merge in the AFL and NFL. And people are like, these guys are really talented. They're making all pros. They're all, every year. They're, you know, they eventually will go to the Hall of Fame. Um, and so there's a great article I found in, in the Florida papers that like looking at these NFL rosters, they're like Florida a has got more players in Florida and Florida State. Like, what are we doing wrong? Right. Like they're like, we need to figure out how to get some of those players on our campus. Uh, and then they're getting squeezed and by the late 60s, by 67, they're getting squeezed at the high school level that the the um, Johnson administration and the health, education and welfare uh, begin to department begin to demand. Uh, integrated schools. And so that the places like Florida were very slow in desegregating their schools. And so we in, we see the end of the dual education system. So those black high schools that were the feeder system to Florida A&M, those begin to close. And I always talk, this is where I take from Derek Bell's great work on rethinking Brown. He's like, you know, thinking about the cost of integration, right? In that process, you lose black principals, you lose black teachers, you lose black football coaches, right? And so the kids get integrated, but none of the administrators and teachers and mentors often go with them. Uh, And those are the people who are saying, young man, you should go play for Jake Gaither. Now they've got white coaches and white mentors and white principals saying, you're really talented. You should go to X predominantly white institution because it's better, right? Um, And so the logics of the civil rights movement about integration are actually working against these these extremely successful uh, black college football programs. 
And so Bob Hayes represents the kind of the apex of that golden age. He goes, he's the Olympics, he's leading an all-American team, he's extremely successful in football and track, and they see the Olympics as a showcase for the kind of Black talent. Whereas in 1968, we see John Carlos and Tommy Smith are saying, because Black power has now entered the scene, there's a frustration with the civil rights movement, that they are saying they're using this sports platform not as a, uh, a showcase, but as a platform to talk about injustice, right, to come in and support. And Gaither was very uncomfortable in using sports as that kind of platform to demand these kinds of uh, changes at you know, he felt that Tommy, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith should be grateful, like Bob Hayes was, for the opportunity uh, to do this. And they were like, what is he going to do? You know, what are we going to do if we, you know, because we run track? Bob Hayes is actually the exception because he was a football player more than he was a track guy. So when his track career is over after the Olympics, he's able to go on to the NFL, play 10 years and ultimately end up in the Hall of Fame. John Carlos and Tommy Smith don't have that opportunity, right? There's no, they, they're not football players. So asking them to make that adjustment, they recognize that their career, post-track career looks can look a lot like Jesse Owens, where he was racing horses and 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 and, and doing these kind of um, sideshow kind of engagements in order to make a living. And so I think that that's where there's a really big disconnect between Gaither and this next generation. It's also, he's also like 70 years old at this point, you know, like he's, 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 um, you know, 68, 65, and he's really trying to figure out, you know, to be thankful that he even lived that long, given the surgeries that he had 25 years prior, but now He's really, he feels like it's time for him to turn over the reins to a next generation. The book opens up and we're going to uh, wrap up our conversation tonight uh, where you begin. That game, that infamous game of 1979. Talk to us about that high point, uh, that game and what that meant. That's almost sort of a closure of that moment that you call the golden age of black college football. Yeah, in 79, uh, Gaither, one of the last things that he does while he's athletic director is that him behind the scenes is able to help negotiate a home and home series with uh, the University of Miami on the schedule. And Miami was the first predominantly white team, big whites program, so Florida, Florida State or Miami to schedule Florida A&M. Uh, and they had Florida and m had recently hired Rudy Hubbard, who had been an assistant coach at Ohio State, and he had gotten the program, even though these challenges that they faced uh, with uh, integration and, and whatnot, he had gotten the program humming. They had come into that game winning 25 or 26 games or something like that. And uh, and and Miami was contemplating ending the football program several years before that game, and they end up hiring Howard Snellenberger most famously. And Howard Snellenberger uh, puts Miami on this ridiculous schedule that by even by modern standards, they play all over the country. They played in Tallahassee twice early in that season. Florida a and was the second time. They traveled to Tokyo to play a game. They go out to Oklahoma that year. I mean, they did like like I want to say it was like 10,000 miles or something and travel uh, that season. And, um, and so Miami's not a strong program. It's not the Miami that we imagine, uh, but they walk into a buzzsaw and Florida A&M saw this as their opportunity to finally make that statement. And I talk about that as the possibility, right? That's really, you know, 10 or 15 years too late from the apex of when Florida A&M was great. And it's very emblematic of the kinds of challenges uh, that, that HBCUs face and even scheduling these teams. And so Miami comes to Tallahassee and they lose on a, on a field goal, on a missed field goal at the end of the game. And it's really this kind of carthotic moment for FAMU, FAMU fans, Gaithers in the, in the stands looking down, um, really watching this game. And it's a moment that really signals what I think of as the possibilities of Black college uh, uh, athletics, if had given the same kinds of resources and opportunities at the peaks of these programs. Um, and this is also a, a, an example of, of why predominantly white institutions refuse to play them. Um, most notably, Grambling didn't play LSU. I don't think they've even 
Uh, Southern has never played LSU. I think Gremlins played LSU maybe twice. We see these these things, and even when they play them, they're playing them, um, you know, where the field is so far tilted into the advantage of the 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 Division One One uh, A program that you don't, you know, they see this as a check, right? That the black colleges need to do play these games in order to get uh, funding to keep their financial uh, their finances afloat for athletics. And so, but they don't, they're not a, on the field, they have less of a competitive uh, moment, especially for some of the big programs like Ohio State and whatnot. But, you know, in 61, uh, Gaither was pretty clear that he didn't think anybody was better than his 61 team. And I think that, you know, uh, there are some teams from Grambling in 55, there's a team in uh, 62 or 63 from Grambling, you would put up against any team in the country in those years, right? And so, those opportunities did not present themselves because of segregation. And so it's really, we only get glimpses of what that possibility. And so the 1979 game for me was a glimpse of the possibilities of what black colleges could have done if we talked about and really lived out an equal playing field between HBCUs at their apex against predominantly white institutions. Blood, sweat, and tears. Jake Gaither, Florida a and and the history of black college football. If you don't have a copy of this, make sure you get it from your local independent bookstore uh, or get it ordered, uh, the University of North Carolina Press. Derek, I want to end, I can't find a better way to end this conversation than with your words and the way in which you end uh, this elegant and wonderful book. Integration was necessary, but it came at a cost. The sporting congregation crumbled, especially for Black coaches. Lost in the rightful celebration of Brown v. Board of Education is the fact that thousands of teachers and coaches lost their jobs. The human resources that had guided young African-American students to HBCUs dramatically declined. HBCUs golden age of football waned. What still exists in black college football is the ethos of the Southern black community. This community is exemplified in the tailgates, the classics, and most importantly, the marching bands. In the decades after the golden age, the community ethos in the stands, parking lots, and after parties has become more important than a game on the field. The continued community support for FAMU and other HBCU programs signals that Black communities still support the teams even if the era of Gaither, Merritt, Mumford, or Robinson never returns. HBCU football is still a location of self-determination and Black culture. Derek White, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, the book is Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Jake Gaither, Florida a and and the History of Black College Football. I want to thank my colleagues in the program in African American Studies at Wake Forest University, our Office of Athletics, and our colleagues at the Slavery Embrace and Memory Project for hosting tonight's program. My name is Corey Walker. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.